Hello and welcome to the 18th episode of In Our Defense. Hello Shiv, how are you? Busy collecting awards these days? Ah, uh, just the usual. <laughs> just the usual. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, been a it's been a nice award season. Yeah, here for uh, podcasts in as general well. and uh, for everyone at Indian yeah. Group as well. Yeah, so Shiv uh, won the best anchor award uh, yeah. at the Enba Awards that that were held uh, over the weekend, and uh, one of our podcasts, uh, Nothing But the Truth, hosted by uh, our senior colleague uh, Rajin Gupta, who's the yeah. Uh, director, editorial director of publishing uh, for Nerd Group uh, one. So, congrats to sir, and congrats to Anna, the producer of that show as well. Yeah, by the way, big. Anna is also our producer, so yeah, <laughs> so reflected glory for in our defense. Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so, how have you been? How have you been a week? It's been a good week, but uh, you know, uh, less and less defense and more and more mm. politics. Uh, we're in April now, so yeah. which means uh, we're in the same month as the elections actually yes. starting. and uh, every time this happens i actually have to remind myself oh so here you are doing another election when you had promised last year that this would be your last election so well here we are yeah all uh, right so we are going to discuss china this week uh, yeah. because of a recent uh, development that happened i won't say development per se but just like news headlines of china going along and renaming uh, so to speak around 20 places in arunachal pradesh which china has historically claimed as part of its territory uh, it's never been actually physically in on occupation of that of that region it's always been part of india and india rightfully said that you know imaginary changing of names is not going to do they basically saying that you know they are just like you know living in a dream world so we won't really spend much time on the optics of it because there are no optics of it the international reaction to it also pretty straightforward that yeah. you know it's india's territory so i mean china really has no claim over it and they've been doing this for a while especially in the last few years it's been a it's been a re- recent trend of them going out and just like you know changing uh, changing names or what they call it regularizing names of certain regions uh, of uh, what they claim to be part of chinese territory in arunachal pradesh uh but we'll talk about china and uh, we will not talk uh, like we did in the previous episode of only of the events that have happened in the aftermath of the galwan valley clash or the doklam stand up that happened a few year couple of years before that clash uh, or the ongoing stand off uh, because we've spent an entire episode on that but i actually want to kind of go back to the history uh, the history of how the tensions between india and china began in the first place and especially the history of arunachal pradesh you know when we were discussing what we should discuss this year this this episode uh, on our whatsapp group you had rightfully said that you know arunachal pradesh is a region where india took a severe beating during the 62 war the war was fought on two fronts uh, yeah. you had the western sector which was your ladakh region and you had your eastern sector which was your uh, arunachal pradesh region uh, i think in the western sector uh, India had some uh, battles to be proud of including that famous battle of Rajangla which yeah. obviously we'll we'll get into uh, as we talk uh, deeper in this episode but in Arunachal Pradesh I think India mostly and mostly saw defeats China was able to invade quite uh, quite quite far far in before the ceasefire and then they kind of vacated because they said okay ceasefire etc uh before we go to the, that war before we talk about the history of tensions i want to briefly ask you about your journey uh, in the media industry uh, as a defense reporter and your shifting of reporting from pakistan to china because like we discussed like we mentioned during the first episode of season 2 that you know pakistan is not something that might come up much uh, china is how was the journey for you when did your shift in reporting towards china happen you know that's a that's a really amazing question that uh, you know most people don't actually think about a lot from a reporter's perspective uh, because <clears throat> uh, you know as a as a military and a defense journalist pakistan is that very well well rounded well you know uh, well identified kind of villain of the piece right <clears throat> you've got all your stories as far as partition are concerned the wars that have been fought between india and pakistan and you know all the things that you know we've been brought up to regard pakistan with makes pakistan an easy villain so the the journey from considering pakistan as india's main sort of strategic adversary to finally evolving to look at china has been a very difficult one i can tell you that because even now you know india continues to be very pakistan obsessed mm-hmm. i'm talking about in the media media <clears throat> it's only post 2020 that we've started seeing a greater uh, you know realization that the the country that uh, you know genuinely wishes us harm and and has the capacity to cause that harm uh, is china uh, that's where our competition is so so to move moving from that kind of obsessive hyphenation with pakistan to looking at uh, us as a 
far bigger you know pakistan is somewhere in the rearview mirror whereas china is looming in front of us has been a has been a something of a journey now <clears throat> once once you acknowledge that china is your main adversary uh uh it's been it's been uh, as as a reporter i can tell you it's a it's a far more difficult thing to process because unlike pakistan you know which was a part of india mm. you know the people are uh, from there are of you you know from the same roots uh you regard them they've got the same language we look the same for most part uh you know so there are all those cultural similarities as well china is like this kind of alien other right it's another race it's another people it's they're very distant <clears throat> you know the, the, they're very mysterious about their intentions uh and therefore uh, the covering china is a completely completely different ball game uh no similarities whatsoever you know even the even you know pakistan for instance ha- has a kind of has had a kind of outreach i've i've been to many uh, uh you know events at the pakistan high commission and there have been efforts to try and you know talk to journalists and kind of cultivate people etc uh not that i was ever cultivated but i'm just <laughs> saying uh and uh, but but as far as the chinese are concerned they very, they very different in the way they do things so uh, those cultural differences obviously the geographical distance the fact that india and china have only fought one major war uh they have very little in common apart from these these links uh, obviously made it a very very uh, distant kind of journey yeah uh, right so let's get to it then uh, let's get to our topic of discussion and uh, again before we go to the genesis of tensions the uh, the history of the war etc an understanding uh, someone who like you who's been co- covering the world of strategies or strategic defense etc for for so many years the importance for china of laying claim to those two regions yeah. aksai chin which it occupies and arunachal pradesh which it does not historically since we read about india china tensions it's historically been said that china has always claimed these two these two territories uh, even though there is uh, there is uh, some argument that there is no proof of china actually having any links with aksai chin altogether it's just after it invaded tibet and took that over then it was like acha humko to ye bhi chahiye and it was the british tibet agreement the mcmahon line which china refuses to acknowledge uh, anyway so why does china lay claim to arunachal pradesh why does it lay claim and occupy aksai chin what is so important for it it's almost like a sort of a pincer on yeah. in india right two opposite ends of your loc sorry lsc and you have no not much uh, disagreement there are some but not much disagreements at, in, in the middle alt at, at all so let, let's go back a a few decades to you know first put things into perspective as far as arunachal are concerned and i can tell you that most people are very surprised when they read about the history of arunachal pradesh because it's for large part it's not what they uh, not what they uh, you know perhaps thought was the reality <clears throat> for instance do people know that arunachal pradesh became a state as recently as 1987 it became a state in 1987 under rajiv gandhi as prime minister do people know that before 1972 the word arunachal didn't even exist for a place in india yes. it was called the northeast frontier agency it was uh, converted into a union territory under indira gandhi right after the 71 war and renamed arunachal jess arunachal and that was a union territory and then almost 15 years later under rajiv gandhi it was named arunachal pradesh and it became a, a you know a full indian state <clears throat> that journey has been a difficult one because since the 50s and and again going back to the 50s now uh, with china's invasion and occupation of tibet the huge spillover of the you know the of of tibetan citizens including the dalai lama into india basically meant and this is this is once again something that a lot of people uh uh you know don't realize about china is india and china have never been neighbors mm-hmm. we were never neighbors we don't have a common border china is nowhere close to india there's this huge massive country called tibet right in the middle between india and china china by occupying invading uh and annexing tibet uh in the 1950s basically became a neighbor of india mm. by 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 virtue of its actions not by virtue of india's actions not by virtue of tibet's actions by virtue of its own territorial appetite its uh, kind of insatiable uh, appetite for expansion geographic expansion uh using all manner of uh, you know all manner of uh, maps and civilizational nuggets and 
all kinds of very dubious and questionable uh, elements and proof to justify this uh, this whole thing which is the same the same way that it uh, you know that it justifies its hold on aksai chin the same way that it ju- that it justifies its claim on arunachal pradesh which it calls south southern mm-hmm. tibet uh, and it has a name for it called zangnang i agree with you dev when you say that you know china releasing an official list of names of rivers and mountains and towns and uh, etc in arunachal pradesh is very much part of the old tired chinese playbook which is that you know uh short of military action do everything else to occupy the enemy frustrate them play mind games with them psychological operations propaganda you know confuse them bog down their resources into replying to every one of your provocations which we so gamely do with press releases and ma uh, you know uh, press conferences but that's their job i'm not i'm not saying it's wrong uh, but uh, but with china india uh, uh, tends to be reactive and defensive mm. that has actually changed since 2020 even though it actually began with a reaction to chinese aggression but since we're talking specifically about arunachal pradesh uh since since the 1950s uh, uh after the annexation of tibet when china basically became a de facto neighbor of uh, of uh, of india and remember this was 40 years after the mcmahon line was was drawn by the british in 1914 1915 if i'm not mistaken uh which they never regarded as as correct uh there were lots of dubious things said even by the tibetans about what that line really meant uh but these were these were cleared up later between uh, you know representatives of the british and the tibetans and the mcmahon line was drawn <clears throat> now shortly after the annexation of tibet uh we all know what happened between india and china in 1962 a war was fought uh and uh, it was a it was a war where india won many battles small battles but we lost the war very badly there's no mm. there is no there is there, there's no two ways of saying what the result of that war was it was a it was a major and profound defeat of the indian military in 1962 at the hands of china uh the import, the, the 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 reason why arunachal is very important as far as the 62 war is concerned is the chinese the chinese invaders the chinese invading force controlled a part of tawang which is the you know which is the the, the, the tawang corridor for a few days mm. at the end of the war they controlled territory inside arunachal pradesh for a few days but as we all know at the end of the war they completely withdrew after after the war ended they completely withdrew because the because the result of the war was so uh, so plain to see the, the the you know that it was so, such a one sided affair in especially in that particular area that the chinese finally withdrew the the reasons for their withdrawal are are still a matter of debate right now why did they, why didn't they just continue to stay there there are various many theories for that but they withdrew from a place which they now call zangnang right which they now call south tibet which they now are naming places in mm-hmm. etc so so china so so while we do say that china has never occupied arunachal pradesh during the 1962 war their military did control the tawang sector mm. uh, so th- that is a very very important thing to remember because that goes into the heart of why arunachal is such a such a flashpoint issue as far as china is concerned in 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 the chinese psyche especially the chinese military psyche dev uh, arunachal pradesh tawang this sector this area is seen as a uh, you know was seen as a low hanging fruit for china saying you know we 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 whacked you here once mm. the way they see it is telling india we whacked you here once don't pro- provoke us too much because then we'll just take what's ours now between the 1950 india between the 1950s and now is a vastly different india uh, the, the kind of india that the chinese saw in 1962 when they fought uh was a brave was a very brave military as we saw in uh you know battle after battle including in walong in arunachal or rezangla as you said where s- vastly smaller numbers of indian soldiers uh you know outfought huge swarms of chinese uh, regiments uh, and you know held them off from uh, strategic locations for w- w- which are amazing battles but uh, you know as as fine as the fighting was ultimately those those battles were lost mm. and we lost hundreds of really really brave soldiers kumau regiment rajput regiment etc uh, and the reason why i bring that up is because china has always believed that 
this is an easy this is an easy place for us to win uh, except that post 72 after the 71 war when bangladesh was liberated and when the indian military kind of uh, uh, you know the, the indian military was always seen as a brave and capable force but we have to understand that post 71 that the identity and the reputation of the indian military was sky high mm. it was a global reputation it was no longer just a regional army or a regional air force it was like these guys mean business they can liberate countries you know these these are not these are not the guys we fought in 1962 so we have to play safe which is when all the other things started happening which is when china realized okay we cannot fight a full fledged conventional war again with these guys because they've learned their lesson now they know how to fight a war and if we fight a war we're going to lose a lot with these guys so arunachal is no longer going to be something that we can you know smack and grab so we'll have to start playing some mind games we will deploy in a big way we will send in small infiltrators here and there you know uh, uh pin pricks here and there psychological mind games rename towns and mm-hmm. rivers and mountains etc and that's basically it right now that is that is that is china's whole angle as far as arunachal pradesh is concerned they, there is nothing they can do about it yeah uh, right uh, staying on the topic of the 62 war uh, i want to bring in some politics over here now and why not i mean the election cycle after all and all I'm, the juicy 1962 <laughs> politics yeah and i'm pretty sure this is going to get raked up at some point or the other during the during the uh, the election campaign as people as bring it up even when they're not talking not about talking 62 about it, war yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah. so that'll be the second part of what i'm about to uh, ask you to discuss but the first parts a slightly juvenile but uh, uh it may seem i'm not saying it is but it may seem to be a bit uh, so bit of a juvenile question is uh was it or is it fair to expect the indian army or the indian military to have overcome chinese forces in 62 because remember we were just a 15 year old nation by then 14 15 year old nation i'm not saying the army was the army is obviously older it was part of the british army but the systems the civilian systems that were overseeing the army so i'm pretty sure the soldiers were well trained uh, they were brave the officers were well trained they were brave the internal army structure was there but you had the civilian o- oversight right the defense ministry the defense minister of the day etc etc that was fairly new so the interaction between the civilians and the and the military uh, officers was still a sort of a work in progress like i said 14 15 years uh, just old so before we get to the politics on this particular aspect do you think uh, we should perhaps give the military a benefit of the doubt because of that well most definitely uh, you know but the, the thing is I, i don't believe that the indian military should be blamed at all hmm. I don't think they uh, they ought to take any share of the blame for uh, what happened in 1962 because uh, like you rightly said in your opening uh, part of that question uh, it was very much uh, you know the, the compounding of many reasons including decisions taken at the civilian leadership level uh, and you know as a student of uh, as a student of war and uh, a defense correspondent I am not one of those people who is going to sit here and say oh nehru took all these terrible decisions and uh, and uh, oh he was foolish by not deploying the air force and things like that because uh, uh having read war reports having read you know detailed uh, you know detailed logs of how these things happened these are incredibly complicated things okay uh, they they only seem sentimental and emotive if you sort of distill and reduce them into you know little tamasha mm. Uh, you know nuggets for social media it's not like that at all uh, i'm not saying that bad decisions weren't made of course bad decisions were were made and that's the reason why we uh, uh, india uh, you know lost the war so uh, you know so uh, convincingly but uh, but the the reason why the indian military in many ways tactically was not prepared for the chinese uh, sh- chinese uh, operations was they were ill prepared they were not equipped well mm. they didn't have you know, and I'm, i'm let me go down to the tiniest nuts and bolts and then i'll talk about the larger decisions they didn't have good high altitude equipment mm. going down to shoes there are famous anecdotal stories many of them real about how in in the chushul sector many uh, soldiers simply didn't have uh, you know reserve kits uh, in terms of special clothing and this we're talking about freezing temperatures when this war was fought right uh uh they didn't have enough uh, uh, equipment to cross rivers like in the arunachal uh, arunachal sector uh, uh there were ammunition shortages in many areas uh there were huge logistical problems in terms of delivering troops rapidly into places where the chinese were coming in from 
as a result they were able to pour in across the border in many places uh, so the military was simply not prepared for this and the reason why it wasn't prepared is because we have to remember that after the 47 uh, conflict with with pakistan there had been no war the first war to be fought was the 62 war mm. which means that the indian military was was not yet a war fighting military uh, it was like you said a, a freshly independent country 15 years is a decent amount of time of peace of mm. relative peace of no real threat to you to think that you're not going to be a war fighting nation all of that changed after 62 62 is, is the is the war and the conflict that changed all of that because then you had 62 then you had 65 then you had 71 then you had 99 then you've got had all the you know all the other militancy and terrorism mm, yes. in kashmir etc so 62 was a was a the the heralder of what india would become as a war fighting nation uh and uh, and therefore i think the the evolution of india and how it actually saw these things at that time changed very dramatically the civilian leadership was caught completely off guard by the chinese operations now you know we can we can sit here and make this about nehru and others and personalities and stuff but we all know that governments are large structures and of course terrible terrible errors of judgment were made including not deploying the air force hmm. uh you know for offensive operations uh m- many other similar uh, anecdotal uh, you know uh, nuggets exist of uh, you know bad decisions that were made certain promotions within the armed forces have become scandalous in hindsight about who was made the army mm. chief who was made the eastern commander all of these are very well documented dave in terms of you know how hindsight gives us clarity as of oh it's because of this that you know we got whacked in arunachal oh it's because this guy was sent there and the air force was not sent with him that this is what happened in uh, in in ladakh sector so these are these things are easy to do but i can tell you that there was a there was an overt level of trust between nehru and his counterpart in china uh there was the hindi chini bhai bhai uh, you know echoing between the two countries very prominently across uh you know the, the media such as it was at that time radio etc rudimentary television uh, and therefore the, the 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 kind of sense of trust between india and china culturally speaking publicly speaking was actually quite strong which mm. meant that the country was caught completely off guard when china moved in mm. so 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 it was a it was a violent and a bloody wake up call but the brutal and uh you know difficult thing to admit and most people will not admit it is that we were completely unprepared the military was not the military fought bravely remember being unprepared is not the same thing as not being brave mm. they were even braver than uh, braver than normal because they didn't have what it really took to fight the huge hordes of the chinese and thousands of soldiers paid with their lives because the system had not equipped them enough had not perhaps given them adequate training perhaps deployments were not Uh, in tune with what the threat perception ought to have been but you know that's the sad reality of it all uh, right uh, i'm glad you addressed that part about uh, nehru because uh, whenever we use that term nehru ki galti the, f- the the most prominent one is the 62 war and uh, not just the fact that india lost the war but also the fact that the war happened in the first place yeah. uh because you, when i was reading and while i've been reading about this uh, one thing that stood very uh, that stood at contrast with what people say that it was nehru's fault that the war happened is the fact that he always was firmly opposed to uh, talking to china or negotiating with china on issues of giving up territory right there was this proposal i think by jao en lai for india to cede control of aksai chin and return for which china would say okay, okay you can keep arunachal pradesh with you but nehru was completely against against it some people say that if he had actually agreed to that proposal perhaps 62 war may not have happened uh, so uh, can you tell us can, can you give us your uh, overview of the lead up to the 62 war the 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 50s the late 50s and the couple of years the so called uh, forward policy of 1961 that apparently was the one that you know kind of sparked the ultimate uh, war with china because china saw india's move in the as, as part of the policy is very aggressive so do you think those were follies and or like you, one, we were completely caught, caught off guard 
but do you think that those were follies and do you think this is a good example of what china does because there's also the counter argument that all this enlis offer was just a way to kind of lull india into this you know it's a sort of a subterfuge yeah. ki we are not doing anything we are there to you know parley with you make friends with you and but at the back back you know they were still planning this offensive i i agree the the, the 1962 war was an act of war by china taking complete advantage of india's complacence uh, uh a complete advantage of india's uh total sense of security vis-a-vis -vis china that sense of security didn't exist vis-a-vis -vis pakistan very importantly and it never existed after 47 but with china that security mm -hmm. existed because of the political uh you know connections that nehru had uh with with the chinese leaders xiao enlai and the others uh and therefore uh you know this kind of strategic give and take you know you give us aksai chin mm. and you keep arunachal pradesh that didn't even really enter the equation because india was very far from realizing that china is not a country to be trusted mm. you know those those offers were were hardly even taken seriously because because india had not yet woken up to the fact that this is a country that a never keeps its word uh, is only a country that respects strength has a, an almost insatiable appetite for geographical expansion uh, which is justified through uh, you know a you know a litany of litany of falsehoods historical falsehoods false maps false civilizational uh, suggestions etc all of these things were brand new to india i mean they, they, india didn't even know these things and the indian leadership didn't know these things and therefore china saw the its opportunity there was no provocation from india there was there was no act of war from india that china responded to by mm. uh, invading it was the chinese seeing and uh, and uh, and probably correctly from their side that this was a country that was not expecting war this was a country that was uh, not just complacent but had been lulled thanks to chinese uh, you know political uh, you know uh, uh, double speak into a false sense of security and china saw its chance to to uh, uh, you know uh, uh, complete some of its objectives as far as territory is concerned but also to also to uh, kind of uh, uh, and and this goes to the point of why they didn't stay in arunachal pradesh mm. after occupying tawang or controlling tawang for a while they withdrew is that they wanted to show who's boss mm. it was it was a an it was a violent act of uh, and remember there was no occupation of territory after that this was china basically telling india we are not equals so you better stay in your place this can happen again if you push our buttons or you you know speak out of place that's what this was about because china had control of tawang and the question of why they withdrew is still not i mean many people have theories for it but uh, you know if they've ever since claimed arunachal pradesh as south tibet and our territory and zangnang and naming places out of it why didn't they simply complete their campaign mm. from there on there are theories that the chinese were so battered mm. that you, you know we think that we got it was a humiliating defeat for india but china lost a lot in that war they 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 won a convincing you know military operation finally at the end of it a campaign but they suffered enormous damage at the hands of of a far less prepared far less equipped india so it's not like they didn't lose they lost a lot but they met their military objectives and their military objectives was to was to occupy a very strategic part of india and to convey a political message to india that that this is not an equal relationship we are infinitely more powerful than you and should push come to shove we will employ this very same brute force to 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 push you to the side and meet mm. our military objectives that's what the 1962 war was about. right uh, so what are the theories for uh, i mean for them withdrawing from from uh, tawang uh, like you said uh, i was actually going to come to this point right a bit later in the in, in the episode but since you mentioned theories about them uh, withdrawing from there one of the theories is that the winter was fast approaching because i think it was november when the ceasefire yeah. was announced and the chinese were basically scared that they might not be able to make it through the winter so uh, you know i think uh, abhishek bhalla was on season 1 of of this of this uh, of our episode of our podcast i think he had perhaps one said it and i want your thoughts on it just a very brief uh, aside uh, 
today let's not talk about 62 but today uh, and i think i've heard this you know uh, from some other uh, defense journalists as well today uh, is india's mountain fighting capability and winter fighting capability better than china because i've i've heard ab- about china not being able to survive well uh, during the winter even during the current stand of that india even if it's a strategic dis- advantage in some places china still faces much greater losses in terms of people because of uh the weather they have to rotate their troops at a much faster rate than yeah. india has to is that in a true true 100% true and i i'll i'll start with the tawang example and then i'll talk talk about ladakh because i've actually seen this myself uh a uh, the, the 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 theory that the chinese you know felt the need to withdraw from tawang because of the winter months uh i feel it's only partially partially it only partially explains the uh, withdrawal because uh what it took for the chinese to actually meet that military objective was an enormous loss enormous loss at the hands of india india lost much more but i'm saying that the chinese lost as well uh and uh, they had huge reserve forces mm. uh, you know uh, on the tibetan plateau so it's not I, i know i know this is sounding very simplistic and easy for me to say that they could have easily you know uh, you know rotated troops faster in order to you know maintain control of the tawang sector but Uh, uh uh that explains at least part of it that i agree with now if you cut cut forward all those years now to 2020 onwards i have seen not only pictures and videos which i was not allowed to take uh, unfortunately during the writing of my books uh post galwan uh post the you know the skirmishes that have happened in pangong etc not only did the chinese have a faster degree of rotation of troops but their uh their rate of um high altitude pulmonary edema or hapo which is the most common high altitude sickness which can be fatal is to an order of about 10 to 15 times that of indian troops uh and in the in the weeks following the galwan clash uh indian observation posts on top of the mountains which had telescopic sights observing what was happening on the chinese side would see nearly a constant stream of soldiers on stretchers being brought down from the mountains and you know and 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 a nearly a, 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 every day nearly six helicopter ambulances taking these stretchers to lower lying areas where they could be treated and this would happen daily like daily there would be like tens of soldiers being taken away with high altitude sickness which wow. meant that hundreds of chinese soldiers were either getting sick we don't know what their fate was but it's it's quite likely that many of them you know succumb to those uh, uh uh to those symptoms uh and they were simply not prepared for it uh, uh because a india uh, the, the chinese had probably thought that after the galwan clash the indians would you know sort of withdraw and give them that space yeah. and they'd be able to bring in their sort of mountain brigades and stuff but after after the clash that happened and after the kind of huge mobilization that followed across the entire eastern ladakh sector uh the chinese were completely and and China is not a country that is caught off guard very often but they were caught off guard in the sense that they completely underestimated how India would respond their sense of India is a bit of a peace snake a push over uh, you know let, let's talk and resolve this kind of country that changed completely and we saw that in the in the especially in the manner in which India uh, you know uh, occupied uh, territory on what china claims is their territory mm. across the line of control line of actual control uh, and which as we've discussed in a previous episode they continue to hold yeah. it's just not reported yes uh, and i'm i'm not permitted to reveal what those posts are but uh, but th- th- in terms of high altitude um, uh, survivability the experience that they've had one has to remember that the chinese chinese experience as far as high altitude warfare is extremely small mm. they they their their entire uh, tradition of having mountain divisions uh, is practically non existent india has had not only had mountain divisions for the longest time but uh, has a permanent presence in siachen yes 18000 yes. feet super high altitude areas uh, and you have uh, you have soldiers from the madras regiment there like people it's it's not like you have people only from hilly states yes. who are deployed there you have soldiers from all over the country deployed in places like tawang bumla siachen and these are super high altitude areas 13 14 15 16 17 18000 feet 
and they are and they and they deployed there it's not like they go there and come back they deployed there for like months together and i can tell you that being deployed on a mountain for a long time rarefied air uh, you know difficult to fight it creates a new kind of warrior mm. it creates a new kind of culture it cr- creates a new kind of warrior so there is no doubt that the indian army is far better prepared for mountain warfare than the chinese yeah in fact in some of the documentaries about the siachen glacier i've heard officers and soldiers say that the biggest enemy at that place is actually the weather and yeah. the mountain and not pakistan or china which by the way is quite close to siachen uh the border at least uh right uh, we'll discuss now a bit about the years after the war uh and where we are at uh, today uh, especially in terms of financial because that doesn't really come up very often unless china goes as and does what it did uh, this week but after a quick break and there are some people who just cannot sleep mm-hmm. and again it's not a moral failing on their yeah. part yeah. they actually their body clock is such that mm-hmm. they just cannot sleep mm-hmm. until midnight or even after and they are not functional before 9 a.m. or 10 a.m. and the joke is that these two people usually marry each other it's actually like that in my house genuinely yeah. like that i go to sleep yeah. at 9 p.m. and i'm up by 5 yeah. my husband goes to sleep at 3 a.m. yeah so i think it's it's um, the foundation of a lovely marriage because <laughs> yeah. it's always someone energized and ready to do something yeah so for adults i do think that it is the morning lark and mm-hmm. night owl i think that a lot of it is a function of the fact that in the last 200 years we have actually not been sleeping as per our biological programming which was this split night kind of sleep welcome back uh, shiv and i are discussing india and china uh, once again but this time we are talking a bit more of the history of india and china's relationship and the tensions along the lse uh, we've talked about the 62 war uh in the years after uh So obviously like Shiv said in the first half of this episode that the 62 war was a huge wake up call that you cannot trust China uh, that even if you want to be friendly with China you have to keep your guard up at least uh, while you go about doing your negotiations uh that was a wake up call obviously however the shift that I have seen in my lifetime from Pakistan to India the shift that you describe at the beginning of this episode the shift that several military officers and veterans will tell you has happened maybe in the last decade decade and a half uh it didn't happen immediately after the 62 war uh i'm i'm pretty sure at the at the tactical level at maybe there were changes being brought to you know kind of uh, uh ensure that the chinese threat was taken care of uh but it did not happen at the larger level do you blame that a on the fact that we had to go to war with pakistan a few years later and then in 71 have to liberate bangladesh uh which automatically led to a sort of a politics that kept india pakistan obsessed or do you think it was just it was just something that would naturally take its take a very long course to happen you're right dave that the 60s were were, were basically a war fighting decade india fought two very destructive wars one in which it lost uh, uh, you know against china the 65 war uh, even though india sort of tactically won that war it ended with a ceasefire un mandated ceasefire uh but uh it was the 71 war that actually had a very very profound effect uh not just in terms of india's obsession as you said with pakistan is concerned which is totally true uh but it also triggered uh uh you know the the history of what we now know as arunachal pradesh mm. because like i said at the, at the beginning of this podcast uh, arunachal pradesh became a union territory only after the 1971 war uh there was a there was a recognition that this was a part of the country that was um, that was vulnerable and it needed uh you know uh, uh, it needed a greater amount of political capital because in a in a country like ours everything flows from political capital if you don't give it political capital political identity attention state borders etc uh you know it will always be seen obscurely as northeast frontier agency and northeast frontier agency was such a sort of anodyne yeah. name for a place as beautiful as arunachal so that's a side note of course that arunachal is an absolutely gorgeous part of the country well connected now there are flights to itanagar etc so if you haven't been there you must go uh, uh coming but coming back to my point the the 72 war not only triggered the creation of arunachal as a union territory uh but also like i said opened the kind of political pipeline to that state 
the tyranny of distance started to end. That tyranny of distance still exists, of course, but it started to end because there was a recognition that what we've done now with Bangladesh is in a part of the country where India will be vulnerable going forward. You know, we've 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 done the unthinkable. We've liberated a country. We've split Pakistan into two, uh, and uh, therefore. we now have more enemies and remember that this was also the time when the china pakistan axis was forming and consolidating and becoming much closer they were they were friends even before that but the 70s is when china and pakistan started to become much closer than normal so and this was a strategic problem for india because they had they had split pakistan into two they had managed to liberate bangladesh but then you had this looming uh, presence of china allying with pakistan in order to meet strategic objectives as far as india was concerned uh you know access to the arabian sea and all those other things we've discussed in a previous podcast mm -hmm. as far as the indian ocean is concerned uh so therefore uh, arunachal became politically important it got its own identity it got its own name uh 15 years later in 87 it became arunachal pradesh as an actual state uh and uh, if we if we cut forward it was in the 70s that the importance of fortressing arunachal pradesh mm. uh, uh you know obviously india already knew that china had ambitions as far as arunachal pradesh was concerned china had already started playing mind games the annexation of tibet was complete uh you know there were there were there were exercises happening very close to the border as they currently are as well right now and therefore india began investing uh around the 70s and 80s in large scale infrastructure projects in arunachal pradesh uh and the reason for this is arunachal pradesh uh sits on terrain which unlike the tibetan plateau is much more difficult terrain china has a huge advantage on the tibetan side of the mcmahon line uh because it's much flatter terrain unlike arunachal which is just valleys and mountains and you know ravines and stuff it's extremely uh, hostile terrain uh, arunachal pradesh where it is where it is profoundly difficult to build infrastructure an example is the sela tunnel which the prime minister mm -hmm. inaugurated last month uh, it has taken a long time to build that tunnel and uh, uh, india has had to overcome huge engineering challenges to actually build unlike china which has been building airfields uh, you know building uh, building roads road head tunnels all the way up to the border with a greater sense of ease because uh, the tibetan plateau on their side is actually far gentler terrain less unpredictable etc less mountainous and it's more plateauish as it's called and therefore india realized that this is a place that's going to be vulnerable mm -hmm. and we have to we can't let it we can't let this this be a place where a real big attack will happen and the the post 1962 trust deficit fueled india into action uh, uh uh and was energized even more the, by the 1971 victory to pay a greater deal of attention to arunachal so political capital huge amount of infrastructure uh a, you know a kind of consolidation of military deployments over there in a very big way that's when you got uh you know uh, 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 uh mountain divisions deployed there in a big way uh, equipment being uh, frontline equipment and aircraft being deployed uh in in this particular sector in a big way advanced landing grounds being built mm. all of this started way back then it's only become visible now because it moved very slowly in the 70s and 80s it started picking up speed in the uh you know in the 90 in the 1990s under pv narasimha rao and others and then uh, post that uh you know uh, under the upa government also a lot of work was done as far as uh, advanced landing grounds are concerned and if you look at if you look at um Arunachal Pradesh now Ladakh is like a place where you know it's it's easier in the headlines you know you can relate to what's happening yes. there because it's closer to Delhi and you know the chinese are sitting there you know about ladakh most many more people have been to ladakh than they've been to arunachal pradesh and therefore it's easier to process mentally in arunachal pradesh you've got the chinese sitting there in a big numbers as well mm. they're infiltrating and uh, creating tamasha there as well you we've seen viral videos of them yes. getting whacked by indian soldiers as well from the punjab regiment of i yeah. if i remember correctly <laughs> with lots of you know colorful words being said as those chinese soldiers are beaten uh, but uh, so so uh, india's focus on arunachal pradesh uh, has taken a long time to build up uh, and china knows that 
uh, you know, Brahma Chelani was on my show. Mm. Brahma, he was very well, well respected, strategic thinker, and he said, China knows that there's, there's no war to be had. They mm. can't. Wi- there's no. You can't win a war here. They're not going to be able to take territory because this is the Indian Army now. The Indian Army knows your game. The Indian Army knows your, knows your, uh, you know, your mental makeup. They know. They know all your playbooks. They know your salami, you know, salami slicing uh, uh, sort of strategies and methodologies. So there's nothing that you're going to achieve here. You can continue to kind of uh, bog down India with your mind games, but Arunachal will not be touched. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because actually I was going to uh, go to that, but since you've completed the whole circle, I don't need to. The the fact that uh, things are quite hot there as well, because like you said in the media, we tend to focus at least for the last four years. Uh, post the Galwan Valley incident, uh, uh, the clash, uh, we tend to focus on Ladakh. And even in the few years before that, you know, we used to focus mostly on Ladakh when it came to an India-China standoff. But things are quite hot over there. And like you said, the army has uh, built up its uh, strength there as well. Uh, I'll uh, move to back to what you had said at the beginning of this episode when I asked you about your journey and your change of reporting focus from Pakistan to China as far as India's main strategic uh, uh, enemy is concerned. Uh, what was it like for the military and what was it like for the military officers? Because, you know, uh, there's also a fun question there, actually. Uh, uh, I remember one of those viral videos where, uh, uh, you know, there was a lot, lot of jostling involved, some uh, pushing involved, etc. And the Indian Army officer was c- kind of trying to calmly tell the, the, his Chinese counterpart that, uh, you know, this is our territory, whatever, whatever, something. Uh, the Chinese officer did not know English to hear a translator. Uh, that guy looked, sounded and behaved, both of them, the uh, interpreter and the officer, very rudely, very obnoxiously. Uh, I've heard from people like you, from people like Abhishek Balla, that whenever these guys sit down for their, uh, you know, whenever it happens, the uh, core commander level meeting, the Chinese officers are usually very uh, brash. frustrating, brash, sometimes they get angry, they try to provoke you, etc. Uh, at the beginning of this episode, you had talked about how... Uh, understanding a new culture because Pakistan at the end of the day we come from the same sort of a sort of a culture so we kind of you know but this is a new culture they have a new way of operating they have a foreign language that we don't know etc for the army even though the army does not do much talking I mean their job is fighting but but still for the army for the for these officers is there also that problem of a cultural shift barrier that comes when it comes to dealing with Chinese army the PLA there has been that cultural challenge but I can tell you that India has overcome that cultural challenge by giving it right back the only the only way to deal with bullies is to give it, give it to them right back which is what has been happening since 2020 now uh, you're absolutely right because I've also seen this that Chinese uh, soldiers uh, it's, a, it's a cultural thing because it's not their personality they've been trained to be bullies mm. because uh, you know uh, like in India you're the, 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 the system the system will shape what your military is like and the military culture in China is is to is to uh, only respect strength China does not respect diplomacy China does not respect rules of engagement China does not respect rules of war. China does not respect, uh, uh, you know, a man's word or a soldier's word. China only respects strengths, which mm. is why if you if they get whacked, they will stand in their place. That's mm. the reason why nothing has happened in Galwan or Hot Springs or any of those places post the Galwan clash. Because when you lose 40 soldiers in one night, it matters to them because mm. they, were not, they were not expecting something like that to happen. I'll give you a couple of examples of my own. When I visited Nathula, I visited Nathula in 2006 to report on the pass mm. opening after many, many decades. Uh, and the Chinese soldiers there, I remember seeing uh, the Chinese soldiers there speaking very, very rudely to tourists and whoever was coming there. You just wow. rudely think, move back and move back. And the Indian soldiers, there, there were no, obviously there were no Chinese tourists. The only Indian tourists like going to Nathula and stuff. And... Uh, the, the 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 Chinese soldiers were you know were very very rude and yelling at Indian tourists, even including children and stuff, and just being really brash and for no reason at all. I can imagine if people were like being unnecessarily, you know, crossing the barrier or something. Everybody was just chilling out over there, and they they were being very extremely rude to them. I've heard stories of how, uh, you know, how uh, Chinese soldiers when they come for meetings they shout, officers shout and yell like mm. you said during border meetings. They express their frustration stand up, up up and down, you know, bang their fist on the desk, things like that, wow. which is real. Because it's, again, like I said, it's not their personality. That's the way they've been trained 
to get results mm. saying uh, you know uh, establish right away that you you are a you know a, a, you're a volatile unpredictable stronger kind of person and you will get your way mm. and if you extrapolate from the from the unpredictable volatile violent soldier and sort of conflate it with the entire country it completely makes sense yes. it's a country that's volatile it's a country that is unpredictable it's a country that doesn't keep its word it's a country that does not keep to its international commitments it's a country that never keeps its word as far as diplomatic mm. assurances are concerned uh, uh so so uh, that's a cultural thing and and and, and the, the united states learned this uh, you know quite early enough india obviously learned it the hard way but i can tell you with with uh, with only a reporter's word that i can give having seen the army both in arunachal pradesh as well as in ladakh and also in the uttarakhand sector we always forget that yes. we share a border in with tibet and uttarakhand as well uh, which is that uh, that uh, india has rapidly rapidly transformed its military culture to realize what uh, you know what talking to a bully looks like mm. uh, and uh, you might think that that means bullying them back it doesn't which is why in the video that you were yes. talking about uh, which i think was in sikkim if i'm not mistaken it was in the snow the video yes, in the snow yes, the very yes. rude soldier yeah that that was in nakula in this sikkim the golgappa video yeah that was that was uh, in sikkim if i'm not mistaken and the golgappa video correctly <laughs> which famously became the golgappa video uh, yeah that was in sikkim for sure and that happened uh, shortly after galwan if mm. i remember and the reason that the, the, the in that video uh, it, it's actually very very typical of how things happen mm. the indian side is usually very very sober initially very very sober and that that and that the video actually captures it beautifully how nicely the indian guys are yes. talking and right from the get go the chinese guys are rude and shouting and you know throwing their fists about and you know basically cre creating a huge shindy while the indian guys are pyar se baat kar rahe hain they're talking like normally sober and stuff now we don't know what happened later obviously some guys got bashed up later mm. but once 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 the fists fly then there are no more niceties that i can assure you and that you've seen that in the tawang video yes. I, i always take the example of the tawang video which is that usme bhi pyar se hi baat kiya hoga the guys who are you know using those wonderful colorful punjabi words in that video i'm sure they spoke very nicely to the chinese soldiers initially but we don't have that part of the video we only have have the part of the video where those poor chinese soldiers are being beaten Beat to pulp yeah. right with sticks so so uh, it's it's all it's not only about culture it's also also about respect for rules of engagement mm. under the under your border rules of engagement when two patrols pass each other india and china have very specific rules a you're not supposed to carry any firearms mm. which it which is which both sides obey b you're not supposed to escalate the situation by raising your voice there are rules which say don't raise your voice don't show anger don't you know make your eyes big wow. and, and and you know and 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 try and provoke any kind of violent reaction don't use expletives uh, you know anything of that kind the chinese never obey that mm. you've seen that in video after video forget about nakula you've seen it in arunachal you've seen it in pangong all of the pangong videos all provoked by the chinese one guy will throw a rock or one guy will you know uh, 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 take his bag and slam it on the ground right in front of an indian indian soldier or something provocative like that and these are soldiers these are, for god's sake these are these are men of war mm. you know a, a provocation before a soldier who is trained to kill you is not a provocation before a civilian so if you if you mess around you're going to get hit mm. and that's usually what happens yeah the chinese are very good at tailoring those videos to show see it seems like the the indians are getting whacked because they you know provoked the chinese etc it's never like that i can tell you i've i've seen these patrols i've seen video after video i've met these soldiers their respect for rules of engagement are far far higher than the chinese and i'm not saying this because i'm indian mm. it's because there's a cultural difference yeah. and that's what it is In fact, I think our readers and listeners should watch that uh, Gold Cup video. We'll have a link in the in our show, in our show notes because I you're right when you say that. I you also see a very good uh, the kind of the military ethos that that we have. Yeah, you know, yeah. there are two moments that I recall. One is where. I, I can over here someone saying ki usko bol sahab se dur rahe hmm. so that that sort of respect by the, he's our officer stay away from him and the other is i think it probably was a jco because of his commanding voice he then instructed every jawan that you know aap sahab ke line ke peeche aa jiye basically stay away from the chinese right. it's done now argument is over now please fall back and let's 
kind of yeah, go home yeah. right uh this an extension on this as we end this episode this was going to be my last uh, point uh, with you uh, the anecdotal bit that we do every every episode linked to what we just discussed right now uh, i don't really want to you know bring up galwan once again and go into this controversy but i do want to talk about this uh during the galwan clash no shots were fired uh i'm not i have read your book but i'm not i'm not i can't recall if you've written about this or not but the me had said that yes when this team went there they had arms with them uh captain amrinder singh was on a show i think with rajdeep sardesai a couple of days after galwan while he was there as a as a as a politician when he spoke when i was about to say i think he was speaking as a former army officer he basically said that the two ic the second in command should be court martialed for not ordering his troops to open fire because if you have your colonel falling down this was colonel santosh babu yeah. the ceo of the regiment falling down uh you just have to open fire uh someone who covers military so closely one do you agree with that sentiment second uh how difficult is it to remember that uh, i forgot which agreement it was that basically forbids opening fire along the lse in moments like this uh, this is not a, your typical fist fight by the yeah. this is not someone giving you an abuse a gali mm. this is your ceo just falling dead in front of you yeah. and so, in so, the death night so a couple of clarifications there were no firearms okay okay uh, the firearms were not brought by the chinese but that does not mean they did not violate the protocol the the manner in which they violated the protocol dave was they brought in riot gear yes they brought spiked clubs of the kind that the chinese police used in hong kong during the protest you know the long the long batons mm. with 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 spikes at one end mm. they brought those they brought these blinding lights which would flash from their batons and in the night which can actually blind you and uh, and the protocol uh, which forbids the use of firearms also concurrently forbids the use of any such equipment mm. you're not supposed to carry any any weaponry of any kind during these d- during these meetings or these confrontations so carrying those spiked clubs and those knuckle dusters and things uh as per the as per the protocol was just as much of a violation as if they had brought firearms so so that's just a technicality the violation was as bad as carrying firearms or rifles or whatever that's number 1 Number two, Amrinder Singh saying that uh, uh, the second in command should be court martialed is is in my view BS, uh, and I'll tell you why. Uh, because a in Galwan, the 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 two the the two groups that had clashed were actually two groups that had met just the previous day as part of a border meeting. They knew each other. Hmm. They knew each other on a first name basis. They knew each other well. They had a proper proper professional connection as two ar- armies. so there was no expectation of this actually happening the trigger point was when the chinese had set up an observation post mm. unexpectedly totally typical of the chinese unpredictable after a very normal meeting now you set up an observation post where uh, you know the river bend is that famous place in galwan mm. why have you done this and when the indian side went, indian group of soldiers went there once again like in the golgappa video it they were speaking soberly saying why are you guys doing this we just talked about this please move this thing back and then the stones started flying that's what no, and this is what i've recorded in my book because it's part of the operational uh, you know report of what happened the stones started flying and a stone hit one of the soldiers after which santosh babu the commanding officer was pushed mm-hmm. by a chinese officer he was pushed because they were talking in a raised voice you know mm-hmm. aggressive kind of voice and santosh babu being santosh babu and the others were the soldiers were the indian soldiers were being aggressive but santosh babu was being very calm saying guys 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 let's calm down let's calm down Let, let's let's chill and talk let's mm. you know let's let's have some chai and let's sit and talk and then one of those guys pushed him now like we've discussed in our galwan ep- episode seeing your commanding officer being pushed is like watching your mother being yeah. slapped and uh, you know the rest is history mm. Th- that push of C- colonel santosh babu was the it signed the death warrant for 40 chinese soldiers mm. and 20 indian soldiers as it turned out very tragically mm. but that whoever that guy is we don't we still don't know who that guy is but whoever it was who pushed colonel santosh babu is the man responsible for what happened mm. in galwan because after that the indian Ch- soldiers could not be stopped of then they, then they they pounced there, there were no orders that were going to be listened to after mm. that then there was no respect for protocol then they went after the chinese and beat them like animals mm. so then uh so 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 that's what i'm trying to say i'm saying that in in galwan protocols were r- serially violated by the chinese mm. in terms of 
acting aggressively in terms of bringing unauthorized uh, equipment and weapons riot gear shields and things like that lights to blind you and dazzle you in the night those were things that were not not at all authorized as far as uh, peace and tranquility agreements and border protocols are concerned and the Chi- the chinese violated them and they paid a price for it yeah who'd have thought that we'd be talking like this for two countries that have nuclear weapons uh, i know yeah <laughs> uh so final brief uh, just thought from you uh, not thought like a sort of a, some uh, input inside gossip if, if if you may uh i'm pretty sure the army may not want this recorded officially but then but it is a practical army so then are there like is there special training for the indian soldiers for such situations whether it is defensive training for how to deal with such and such with such weapons or offensive training of how to use such weapons well there's absolutely there's absolutely training uh, and I, you know you know when i say that the indian army was caught off guard uh, in in uh, galwan i don't mean that they were not able to resist the chinese they as we saw they were able to not only resist the chinese but they most of the fighting which most people don't know and it's recorded in my book most of the fighting happened on the chinese side mm. that's how badly they were beaten that that the chinese were chased to their side and they were most of the violence happened over there the brawl happened on the chinese side uh, but uh, the training is absolutely there uh, there's no question of not being prepared for uh, any kind of subterfuge or uh, you know deception by the chinese uh, so yeah they in terms of training in terms of uh, uh, you know standard operating procedures in case the chinese bring weapons all those things are actually there the reason why the reason why the th- this weapons thing was not seen as a problem is because uh, s- the, the last time shots were fired between india and china was in 1975 yes in 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 sikkim in the sikkim sector uh, which is actually a which is actually a a mini conflict that india won decisively against the chinese mm. it was a chinese aggression uh, 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 it was a ch- it was a watershed moment between india and china far uh, long after the uh, 1962 war where the chinese attempted aggression in the 60s in sikkim and there the indian army fully prepared for the chinese having learned their lessons gave the chinese a very very bloody nose and there's a book that's been written by mm. uh, about it by a person called probal sen gupta which is yes. fabulous on 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 precisely that it's called the forgotten war yes because everyone thinks about 1962 nobody talks about this particular a uh, battle of sikkim so absolutely in uh, 62 ke baad india has been ready for anything as far as china is concerned right i think we'll end it right there uh, thanks shiv once again great insights and uh, very glad we covered arunachal pradesh because that again like as well keep discussed is not really don't dominate uh, headlines when it comes to the stand up with china except when china does what it does like it did this week uh, and to our listeners and viewers once again thank you for your comments that have been coming in every episode uh, remember that we do make notes about what you want us to discuss so if you have anything for us to discuss if you have any questions for us do let us know we'll bring them into the flow some way or the other thanks as always to our producer ana priya darshini that's it for this week's defense dose for more tune in next week till then stay safe and do not cross any boundaries with your passport bye bye